We're going to read the text here in just a minute of the Good Samaritan, familiar passage, but I hope it's not so familiar that we really don't take it to heart. And we've got the notes of the message, and uh, if God speaks to you, and we're, that's what we pray, that God would minister to you, be personal, uh, you write it down. But these notes are, are reminders throughout the week in the good scriptures, uh, and then also questions we use in our Bible study on Wednesday also. You can use it in your small group. Uh, then also, if you can follow along in your Bible, Luke chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take it home. That's a pretty good deal. But if you'd read along with me, Luke 10, verses 25 through 37 in the New Living Translation. It says, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man laying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him, lying there, but he was also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now and go do the same. I'd like for you to keep in mind this passage out of Luke. It's the gospel of passion in action. Passion, compassion equals action. And it's important to understand the context of this passage, the setting, the occasion for the teaching. It says a lot. Uh, the who and why of the parable, the context before the parable, Jesus was doing a lot of teaching about living as human beings, gave the Beatitudes, the eight blessings, such as, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Teaching about us being salt and light in this world. And the golden rule. What if we'd live by the golden rule? Do unto others, you'd have them to do unto you. We were at a leadership conference in Maryland, and this uh, leader in Facebook, if you've heard of Facebook, Took a lot of time, study, money, evaluation, uh, survey on how to have more positive, productive employees. And they were named the uh, corporation to work for. And what they found out, duh, I could have taught them without all that money and time and study. Just listen to Jesus and the golden rule. They found out if you treat people right, they're going to do you right, they're going to work hard, and they're going to have positive attitudes. You know, even the context after the parable that was told, the seven woes or warnings to the hard-hearted religious Pharisees. An example, if Jesus was here today and we had a person with a withered hand and Jesus healed him, would you do like it says in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice as well as weep with those who weep? But the Pharisees, the religious, the harshness, the hard-heartedness, 
instead of rejoicing over the healing, we're more concerned about Jesus, the rules, healing on the Sabbath. That's, that's pretty sad. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan to say to them and to us, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Now, Leith Anderson, Moody Magazine, pastor and author, writes, and this is so important, to come to place from where being a Christian is just going to church and following a set of rules into that spirit relationship and living out of that. Because we don't naturally come with compassion and putting the other person first. We have an inward battle to fight our natural selfishness and sinfulness. And that's Romans 7. Uh, me and my flesh dwells no good thing. But we live out Romans 8. Hopefully, life out of the spirit, we have victory. And uh, we're your conqueror and victory over that sin sinfulness and selfishness. And we have the spirit that Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit that's within me. A compassion that way. But listen to this uh, quote by Leith Anderson. The Christian life is to be lived by relationship, not rules. The Christian's relationship with God is based on love and commitment. Holding God's moral law in highest regard, but, be, but depending on the grace of God to live it out. His morality and compassion in everyday practical circumstances. Every relationship is a bit, a bit different. And that's why God's personal and individual. There's not cookie cutter uh, carbon copies of Christian. We live it out each day. There's certain principles that we follow, but God's with us each time as we're sensitive to that. And he, he leads us to show his love and compassion. So there is freedom in that individuality. Every relationship learns and grows through experience. Life by the Spirit, not by the rules. Jesus was saying to his disciples that there was a blessing, a different way to live for those who hear through spiritual ears. He often said that. And see through spiritual eyes. Uh, if I'd had time, because we got several things going on uh, in the message this morning, but you've, see, you've seen the video where the person ignores and is insensitive and apathetic to all the people that's around him. That's what, that's what one of the songs was about. Then he put on God glasses and how he saw people different. It reminds me of, what, uh, of the teaching in the Word of God about the man was healed of blindness, but he only saw people as trees. And then Jesus touched him the second time by his Spirit, and he saw people as important human beings, individuals, and cared about them. So Jesus is asking us, as his people, to see through his eyes, because he speaks to us, to hear in spiritual ears. I experience that, sometimes I miss it, and I, I'll confess, as I go through uh, the, about the different characters to do with the Good Samaritan, I've just about been in each place. I've missed it at times, but I want to strive by God's Spirit to be the Good Samaritan. But we were, I went at Tom Barnett's church up in Clinton, filled in one Sunday, and we stopped by uh, Benjamin's to eat breakfast or uh, uh, early dinner after the service. And uh, I, we were sitting there at the, at the uh, table and eating, and there was a couple that came in and looked pretty rough, and they had a child with them, and just, the, I felt God's speed. It wasn't me. I wasn't even thinking those terms, but I felt the compassion and love of God well up within me, and the Lord told me very clearly, pay for their dinner. You know, it's just, we make, make it too complicated sometimes when we feel compassion, feel love for people. That's God. He's speaking to us. And then we're to act, be sensitive to it, act, and obey. But then, in the parable, and then a certain lawyer, an expert in the Jewish law, stood up and asked Jesus, Teacher, 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Pretty good question. Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you read it? What's your take? The man answered, and he answered, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment that had already been communicated. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Then it, this man's heart was revealed. First, his whole motive, and we need to check our motives, why we do what we do, for asking this question was to test and tempt Jesus into saying something that they could use against him. He didn't have a pure heart and pure motives. Second, the scriptures tell us in wanting to justify his actions, you've got to remember he's a lawyer, he was looking for a loophole. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Then Jesus told the parable, the story of the Good Samaritan. In response to that question, who is my neighbor? In telling the story, Jesus revealed several examples of kinds of hearts. The hardened heart, the closed heart, no empathy, no compassion. First of all, the thieves. Think of the heart of the thief who robbed and beat up the victim. I'm just overwhelmed at times how one human being can be so cruel to another human being. They plotted the evil. This will be easy pickings. You know, it's only 16 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. Curvy, narrow road, good places to hide, as you can see there. Easy to take a victim by surprise. And their selfish focus, what was upon their hearts and their minds. Oh, the riches we will get. Proverbs tells us about that. Don't hang out with people like that. Their conscience was seared. You know, you can so resist that conscience within to do what's right that you can actually have a seared conscience and a hard heart to where you don't feel empathy, you don't feel compassion. That's a terrible state to be in. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Then there's the more subtle, less obvious hard hearts of the priest and the Levite. They both saw the need. The priest tried to ignore it, looked at it from a distance saying, I don't want to have any part of that. Indifferent, apathetic, unattached. Perhaps he used the letter of the law about not being uh, defiled by touching a dead person. But the man was not dead. But rationalized, well, he could be soon. Some of our rationalized sometimes are in justifications and excuses. The Levite now came a little closer to examine the situation. He looked on him but excused himself. He was too busy. It would be very inconvenient. He had more important matters to tend to. He was late for appointment at the temple. You know, the Lord kind of laid upon my heart, and what I was searching as I prepared this message was, because I'm in that stage of life, uh, we think about, you know, the American dream, retire, self-indulge, uh, do what I want to do, but it really hit me plainly. God's not called his people to live like that. We're to live for him and to live for others and to serve. Maybe he said to justify himself. This man knew better than to travel this road by himself without weapons. It's his own fault. How we can omit to do something because we justify it and think about it and talk ourselves out of it. Now, I'm not talking about not having wisdom. You need wisdom. You need discernment. But I'm talking about if God lays something on your heart and you know, don't let the enemy talk you out of it. Well, it's their fault or some other rationalization. And he said, fear will keep us. The enemy will use fear. If I stop, I fear being attacked. The heart of the matter is a matter 
of the heart. Watch this video. ask you to use your God-given gift of empathy. Did you ever think about that as a gift from God? And imagine, put yourself in the place of the victim, how devastated and heartbroken the victim must have been. Felt hopeless, hit bottom. He was passed by twice by those who should have had compassion on him and helped him. Then came along the spy Samaritan by divine appointment and a heart filled with compassion. There's the key. Heart filled with compassion and did all that he could. That's all God asked us to do, all that we can to be faithful. Always remember this saying, when you get overwhelmed, don't let what you can't do keep you from what you can do. Some, sometimes the littlest things can make all the difference. But he, he did all he could in bring healing to the man. He had 
a God-shaped heart. That's the desire, the goal of the message that we would live out and God would give us a God-shaped heart. Remember the healing elements, the oil and the wine? They're all, both of them are types of the Holy Spirit of God that brings healing. It says in Psalm 145, 8 and 9, The Lord is merciful, and aren't you glad? And compassionate, He showers compassion in all His creation. We need to keep our hearts of compassion open. Not closed, but open. Learn to follow the flow the love God puts in our hearts. Then be sensitive and obedient to what God wants us to do, as shown by the Good Samaritan, and also by Bonnie, the ER nurse. He was admitted to the emergency receiving place on the cardiac floor. Long hair, unshaven, dirty, dangerously obese, with a black motorcycle jacket tossed on the bottom shelf of the stretcher. He was an outsider to the sterile world of shining tile floors, efficient uniform professionals, and strict infection control procedures. Definitely an untouchable. The nurses at the station looked wide-eyed at this mound of humanity, was wheeled by, each glancing nervously at Bonnie, the head nurse. Let this one not be mine to admit, bathe and tend to with their pleading unspoken message. One of the true marks of a leader, a consummate professional, is to do the unthinkable, to tackle the impossible, to touch the untouchable. It was Bonnie who said, I want this patient for myself. Highly unusual for a head nurse, unconventional, but the stuff out of which human spirits thrive, heal, and soar. She donned her latex gloves, proceeded to bathe this huge, very unclean man. Her heart almost broke. Where is his family? Who is his mother? What was he like as a little boy? She hummed quietly as she worked, it seemed to ease the fear and embarrassment she knew he must be feeling. Then on a whim, she said, we don't have time for back rubs much in hospital these days, but I bet one would really feel good. It would help you relax your muscles and start to heal. That is, the pl that is what this place is all about, a place to heal. That is what this place is all about, a place to heal. The thick, scaly, ruddy skin told a story of an abusive lifestyle, probably lots of addictive behavior with food, alcohol, and drugs. As she rubbed those taunt muscles, she hummed and prayed, prayed for the soul of a little boy grown up, rejected by life's rudeness and striving for acceptance in a hard, hostile world. The finale was warm lotion and baby powder. It's almost laughable. Such a contrast to this huge foreign surface. As he rolled onto his back, tears ran down his cheeks, and his chin trembled. With amazing, beautiful brown eyes, he smiled and said in a quivering voice, No one has touched me for years. Thank you. I am healing. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. You know, Jesus, in telling this parable, revealed the heart and compassion of our God. Jesus answered the question of the lawyer in the telling of the story. We know this because Jesus then asked the lawyer, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked? The man replied, obviously the one who showed mercy. Micah 6, eight tells us what God requires of us, what delights his heart. O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And we need to make this parable personal and ask ourselves, what would we, we do in the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
How would we act? Where would we be? I want to show you a video and ask yourself, in this situation, what would you do? <laughs> when you see that, didn't righteous indignation well up in you? <laughs> Man. But she cared enough and had compassion on that nanny to step in. That's the pra practice of a compassionate heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Neighboring is to love God. Remember that compassion, passion equals action. We're going to love God. We're going to love others. And we're going to live it out. God help us to do that. May we have God-shaped hearts. I love the passage Pastor Dennis had as a text last week. And it's 1 John 4. And I, I read 1 John 4, 7 through 21 every other day to remind me that God is love. He doesn't just have love. He is love. And that, and that needs to flow through me. It's not always easy. It's done by the Spirit of God. I want to close with a kind of a focus a thought from Rick uh, Warren in A Purpose Driven Life because it really uh, says it, kind of sums up our life as a Christian. A great commitment to the great commandment, love God, love others, and the great commission, share the gospel. First of our family, our neighbors, and then beyond. A great commandment, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission produces a great Christian, thus a great church. We are the church. Jesus' final words, now go and do the same. Go and do likewise. Would you bow with me in prayer? And I don't know how God has spoken to you, but I, through this, I sought God and Lord, help me more often have a, a God-shaped heart. I don't know how the Lord spoke to you today, but if you've never really come into relationship with the Lord, maybe you come to church, you say you're a Christian, but you're just kind of following rules. That won't cut it because we can't have that compassion and love. That comes from God and His Spirit. So you come to an altar of prayer and ask the Lord to forgive you. He, it's already a done deal because of the cross. He'll forgive you and ask Him to take control of your life. And you know, the greatest thing that happened to me in my Christian life uh, when I let the Lord take over is just to, to love Him and He gave me a love for others. And that's the only way to live. It's a life of re reward and not regret. And whatever other need that you have here this morning as I read the petitions also. So as we play, we'll, we'll go into prayer. Lord, we're grateful that you're the God of compassion and mercy. God, help us to get a hold of what you desire for us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Be controlled each day. Have your mind and live out in a practical way to bless others to show that compassion that you want us to show. Help us to have that kind of commitment to love you and to love others. Fill this church with your compassion. This may be a place of healing. As we don't avoid the messes, but we go toward the messes because you want us to as we're directed. Give us wisdom and discernment concerning that. And I pray if there's one that really doesn't know you in rich relationship, living that abundant life that you want, desire, and will for us to live, that that would happen this morning as they just cry out to you. And each day, Lord, help us to be willing for you to shape our hearts, to have a God-shaped heart. We lift up our petitions this morning. We thank you for the privilege of interceding for others coming boldly to the throne of grace. 
lift these petitions, dear Lord, and maybe petitions that's not on this list, but deep within our hearts, not even knowing how to pray, but you tell us that the Spirit helps us to, to pray, and you discern that so that you may answer those prayers. Thank for in your wisdom and in your love and in eternal realm, dear Lord, we can trust you, cast all our cares upon you. I lift up these petitions of Fred and Sheila Horseman, Annie Swan, Becky and Chester Drada, Norma Boyle, Bill and Ann Harbor, Ron and Gladys Clinton, Larry Cox, Sherry Corchy, Greg Hughes, and surgery from a broken femur and hip. Be close to them, dear Lord. Then help us to listen to you on what our part is to bring the healing and the compassion. Just thanks for being here this morning, the health, the desire. May it make a difference in how we live out our life this week. For asking in Christ's name, for his honor. Amen. Stand with me and close in the benediction. I want to remind you about the Thinking of You cards. Uh, that's such an easy thing to do, it's such a little thing, but at the right timing to the right person means everything because God makes it live by His Spirit that someone cares. And this world desperately needs to know that there's a God that loves them, that cares, and He does it through us. So may we live out the God-shaped heart this week in the love of God. I ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.